Welcome to NACTV Reads the News. My name is Kathy McGrath, and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NACTV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 17, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at NACTV at wcgwave.ca. And today's issue of the Nipah Banner and Press is for March 1st, 2024. And right here, celebrating 100 years, Nipah resident Joe Duco joins the Centenarian Club by Casper Warren. <clears throat> and pictured above, Joe Duco turned 100 this week. In the top left, Joe and his wife Lorraine on December 26, 1960. Middle left, Joe bottle feeding a calf. And bottom left, Joe was logging for his barn and house in 1960. It's not every day you turn 100. One Nipawa resident is celebrating just that. Joe Duco, who will have who will have living in Nipawa for eight years come June, became a centenarian on February 27th. Duco's daughter, Joanne Cook, and son-in-law, Joe Zabo, met with the Nipawa Banner and Press to provide details and share stories of their dad. Duco farmed for essentially his whole life. Following an accident his uncle had, which resulted in disability, Duco quit school in grade three to assist his aunt and uncle with their farm in Polonia and district. Then, later in his life, he inherited the farm and built onto it, including the rebuilding of the home. Each building, whether it was by the home itself, barn or tool shed, was all made by his hand. He employed a mobile mill to assist with the fabrication of the lumber. <coughs> I was in grade nine when he built that house, said Cook. The operation was mixed, a combination of growing cereal crops and tending to cattle. And Cook and Zabo reported the animals loved him. He'd call, my cows, my cows, and they would come running, said Cook. He was able to make anything. Joe Duco was a very active man in his farm days. In addition to the rigors of farming, he also had blue healers named Buster and Blue. Each and every day, regardless of weather, Buster and, Buster and Blue would be waiting for him at the door to take a three to four mile walk. Whether it was sunny or storming, rain or snow, Nick Duco made the journey with them each day. He also loved snowmobiling, camping, fishing, hunting. Later in life, he became a conservationist, said Zabo. He also made, used to take the 15 mile journey to town on horse and buggy, which was the transportation at the time to go to dances. Still able to wrestle down a strong, stubborn hog at age 85, Duco's last year of farming came when he was 92. He and his wife Lorraine moved to Nipua that year, and although the activities have changed, the energy is still there. After he moved here, he bought a mobility scooter. He calls it his buggy. He goes on that thing every day, even today, said Cook. He'll go down to McDonald's. He goes to Giant Tiger faithfully, even in the winter. He'll still go if the weather permits. Duco also remains dedicated to exercising within his home, having equipment that he uses daily. In addition to having an active life, Duco also possesses a strong, sharp mind. Throughout his life, Duco could see a picture of something or picture it and soon have it made and working. Some such projects included items such as a meat saw, a coal-fed stove with a hopper, fabricating a cab for an old cabless tractor, and a protector for the brakes on his tru old truck to protect them from stones and dirt. Her dad was not afraid of technology. He was able to make anything. He'd think about it and it'd keep him up at night, said Zabo, and by morning he'd have a plan. 
For the brake protector, Zabo explained further that vehicles at the time were not equipped with such things. So when servicing it went in for servicing sometimes afterwards, the dealership servicing him encouraged seeking a patent. Well, Duco did not seek a patent. This sort of brake protection is now commonly used in vehicles today. Cook added, he's never had a computer, but GPS and stuff like that for his farm. Anything to make the farm more efficient, he'd embrace it, Zabo supplied. With stories like these, it is clear that Duco has lived an eventful, inventive life full of stories that would likely fill the paper many times over. The Nipua Banner and Press congratulates him on the special occasion of his 100th birthday. And pictured left and bottom left, working on the barn in 1961, and above and bottom right, working towards building the new house in 1967. Poor choices, costly fixes. Town of Nipua finds the flats change rooms vandalized once again. And pictured on several occasions, access to the washrooms at the flats in Nipua have been restricted due to vandalism. Another such incident happened the day after the Louis Riel celebrations. Authorities are reviewing the video surveillance to track down the person or people responsible by Casper Warren. It wasn't all fun and games at the flats in Nipua last weekend. While there was plenty of family-friendly fun to be had during the winter festival, it was later found that an activity of the up-to-no-good type also occurred over the weekend. Come Tuesday, February 20th, town staff made an announcement via social media that the men's change rooms facility had been vandalized. The cleaning staff had discovered it Monday evening while going to clean, said Nicole Cooper, Director of Recreation Services. Any appropriate words and foul language was written in large letters on the walls. This isn't the first time the washroom and changing room facility for the flats has been vandalized. The most recent incidents prior to this one took place in late 2023, which resulted in the closure of the facility in late October that year. This was a temporary change to deter further acts of vandalism and nefarious activity, while Nipua Town Council discussed the issue further. Prior to this, the change rooms and washrooms were available from approximately 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., after which they are locked. Although unannounced, the temporary closure was lifted a few weeks after. After the reopening, there has been no further issues until the Winter Festival weekend. This continued vandalist activity is something that casts a grey cloud for both the town and those who use the facility in a proper, respectful manner. We know how used the facility is and that a warm place to lace up skates is a necessity this time of year, but it is discouraging and costly to constantly have to clean and paint over people's poor choices, said Cooper. In the meantime, Cooper told the Banner and Press that parents should take a few minutes to speak to their children about being respectful of public spaces. We would hate for a couple of poor choices to take away the amenity for those who use it properly and respectfully, said Cooper. Councillor Yvonne Sisley, who discussed the issue at the recent council meeting, stating, it's very unfortunate that we can have such a great event and utilize the facilities as they should be utilized and then have things vandalized. We're going through the cameras and we'll find out who it was and be looking at proceeding with some sort of justice on that. No further details were available at this time. A pair of arrests made in Nipua, robbery and weapons incident by Sergeant David Taggart from Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Plains RCMP. On February 8th, shortly after 10:12 p.m., Spruce Plains RCMP received a call of a robbery which occurred at a business on Main Street in Nipawa. It was reported that two masked males brandishing knives forced their way into the store. One of the males threatened to stab the cashier. Both males then fled the location on foot. A short time later, while the police were conducting patrols of Nipawa, a pedestrian flagged officers down and informed them two males held a knife to his throat and attempted to rob him. On February 13th at 12.38 a.m., the Blue Hills RCMP received a call of a break and enter to the Esso in Spruce Woods. Two males were seen wearing masks, entering the business and stole approximately $2,000 worth of vape products. Through investigation, the Spruce Plains RCMP were able to identify both subjects. 
With the assistance of MWD Crest, Blue Hills RCMP, and Brandon Police Service, police executed two search warrants on residences in Nipua and Brandon. As a result, police have located stolen items, a face mask, and a knife. A Nipua youth has been charged with two counts of robbery with an offensive weapon, possession of a weapon for a dangerous purpose, two counts of disguise with intent, possession of property obtained by crime, and break and enter. Nic Nicholas Janelle of Brandon has been charged with two counts of robbery with an offensive weapon, possession of a weapon for a dangerous purpose, two counts of disguise with intent, possession of property obtained by crime, and break and enter. Police were opposed to release. However, both were released from custody by the courts depend pending further court appearances. And Looking Back <coughs> by Casper Warren. And pictured NACI 1974, NACI set to perform Cheaper by the Dozen. And pictured is the Gilbreth family as it was set to be portrayed in a stage play of Cheaper by the Dozen by students of the Nipawa Area Collegiate Drama Group in 1974. Members of the cast show and art, Jim Lang and Valerie Dick, Mr. and Mrs. Gelbreth, seated at the center. They are surrounded by 11 of 12 children, played by Stacy Ellis, Sheila Ritchie, Mary, Mary Sauerborn, Leonard Kaharski, Howard Horn, Betty Ann Waslick, Vicki Cameron, Arthur Harris, and John Waslick. 125 years ago, May 24, 1899, a flagstaff was erected on the Opera House. And a note that the section of, for March through early May is absent from the hard copy archives of this year, as such an excerpt from late May has been selected for this week. That's unfortunate. But 100 years ago, 1924, Edrins, news of the reopening of the local brickyard industry still floats in the air. There will be much rejoicing in the Edrins district, district if this proves to be correct. On the day of the execution, the gallows went up in flames and plunged the Blackmoor jail into a raging turmoil of frenzied convicts and panic-stricken jailers. In all the confusion, one man alone was calm. Travers, he saw a chance to get even in the game of life at the Opera House on Wednesday and Thursday, May f March 5th and 6th. 75 years ago, 1949, Orville Nelson returned from England recently with his bride, the former Miss Janet Hogg of Leicester, and Mr. and Mrs. Nelson accompanied George Drysdale from Toronto. Funeral service, service for Waller Seward, 87, was held Monday in Riding Mountain United Church. F. H. White of Kilward officiated, and burial was made in Riding Mountain Cemetery. Mr. Seward came to Canada from England in 1887 and was in the Yukon Gold Rush of 89 and spent 12 years in the north. He returned to Rotty Mountain where he farmed until he retired to the village a few years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. 50 years ago, 1974. Information received during the past week from Tudale Exploration Limited of Winnipeg indicates that the target date for commencement of drilling, a new test hole, will be put down near the old Langford No. 1 oil well that intersected 38.7% from iron in 1947 in Section 36, Township 14, Range 14. 20 years ago, 2004, Elizabeth Harley of Nepal was named to the President's List at Minot State University for earning a grade point average of 4.0. Also named to the President's List at Minot State was Aaron Davey of Nepal for earning a grade point average of 3.5 and higher. Meanwhile, Brittany Gibson of Nepal was named to the President's List at Lake Region State College in Devils Lake, North Dakota. Gibson is attending Lake Region on academic and basketball scholarships. Harley, Davey, and Gibson all graduated from Nipawa Collegiate. Two years after nearly dying, the Nipawa Chamber, Nipawa and District Chamber of Commerce is once again on death's door. In a motion put forward by Monty Simon and seconded by Don Phillips, members will decide at the annual meeting whether or not to give the organization a year's rest. Longtime board member Norma Tarek said she doesn't want to see the organization disband if only for one year but she said it's difficult to tackle projects with only eight board members. 
the cause of a fire that destroyed Nipua's century-old Hamilton Hotel last month has been ruled undetermined. And Home Buddies by Rita Friesen, Lenten Thoughts. For the first time in a long time, I have given up things for Lent. Usually I take on, some, take on something rather than put something down. I have in the past taken up writing notes of appreciation to folks who have blessed my life, knowingly or unknowingly, recently or ages ago. I have taken up the practice of doing an anonymous good deed for the weeks preceding Easter. This year I cancelled all my television channels. Okay, I have a sports network on one device. And I have a smart television, so I'm not entirely without entertainment, but has made a significant difference in my free time, as has the cancellation of the candy crushing game, with no exceptions that here. With the study I do, I came across a statement that spoke clearly to me, expounding on the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, 31 to 38. F. Craddock states, clearly Mark does not want his church to use Easter to escape Lent and Good Friday. I have been guilty of that. Knowing how the story ends with victory, I have respected Lent, perhaps not honoured it. And so changes began. I downloaded the book Seven Story Mountain, an autobiography by Thomas Merton. If I had a paper copy, I would be filled with underlining and tagged corners. This is seldom a page that not, does not cause me to pause. Slow reading. This one. When a ray of light strikes a crystal, it gives a new quality to the crystal. And when God's infinitely disinterested love plays upon a human soul, the same kind of thing takes place. And that is the life called sanctifying grace. And I think of the collection of crystal that I have, simply because it speaks to me. Taking up space in a display case, requiring washing and polishing annually. And I still find some pieces that I wish to add to the collection. A slight crack in a unit causes an interesting refraction. I am that cracked piece, refracting like crazy. I am using my time for faith, for faithfully, and God knows I have time. Walking the dog and tidying when required doesn't take up much of my day. I will admit that the set of grow lights and the emerging plants fascinate me. Here I see Easter as well, a dark, dormant season before renewed life. I am trying a new type of vegetation and some old favorites. It could become additive. Two grow lights with no shelf space. Hmm. Perhaps the kitchen counters, seeing that I don't do a whole lot of food prep. On a totally unrelated topic, for those who are curious, I got my tattoo for Moss Town here in Nipua. It is on the inside of my left arm, a series of three butterflies of graduating sizes and in graduating shades of blue. Beside the lowest dark blue one is the number 27, in memory of Ed, my husband and partner of 40 years. The center one is a light blue with 29 beside it, in memory of Gordon, my partner of 6 years. And the highest is smaller and a soft pastel blue with 79 beside it, in memory of a wee one I carried for 8 weeks way back then. And Local Victoria's Quilts Canada nearing 2,000 quilt milestone. Pictured Town of Count Nipua Councillor Jason Nadeau visited the local Victoria's Quilts Canada gilding, Quilting Guild in Nipua recently. Nadeau spent some time taking in the work the group does. A donation of $100 was also presented by the UCT that day. Victoria's Quilts Canada makes quilts for people within Canada who are living with cancer. The Nipawa chapter of the guild works out of the second floor of the beautiful Plains County Court building and, according to Nadeau, is quickly nearing the milestone of their 2,000th quilt. Pictured from left to right are Melanie Burnett, Audrey Heffel, Jason Nadeau and Susan Phillips. And thumbs up, thumbs down. Two thumbs up for our Nipawa Titans team. They read to our classes for I Love to Read Month and we so appreciate it from Sonia Patterson and the NMS Junior Tigers. And the Gladstone Market Report by Tyler Swinski. After a reality check with a taste of winter, it just reminds us all we still live in Manitoba. More and more cattle producers are welcoming new calves in their operation as we approach spring. As we get full swing into calving, more pen space is needed for the next calf crop. 
keeping the number of feeder cattle and slaughter cattle moving at a steady pace throughout the markets across the prairies. The feeder cattle market was robust today. The front row held many orders and all classes of cattle had demands. We sold 1,019 cattle through the ring in Gladstone on February 27th. The market saw a variety of cattle, whether they were big or small, the market welcomed all classes of cattle with open arms. The market was quite aggressive with reassuring returns. Cattle futures are green and optimism in the cattle industry is at an all-time high once again. Cows and bulls traded with plenty of stability from 125 to 135 with sales to 141.5 showing higher averages. Bulls traded with demand ranging between 145 to 165, with sales to 178.75. All classes of cattle sold well. Planer type cattle are still being discounted. From um, today's sale, mixed steers weighed 405, brought 540. Black steers weighed 515 and brought 451. Crossbred steers weighed 647 and traded for 393, and a big, big set of Red X steers weighed 765 and they brought 365 per pound. Heifers, crossbred heifers, weighed 451 and brought 420.25. A set of black heifers that weighed 500 and they fetched 409. Black heifers weighed 615, traded for 354. And big black X heifers weighed 759, brought 320.25 per pound. Fashion 46 now open in Carberry by Jolene Belcunis. Carberry is adding another hair salon on Main Street. 46, XLVI 46 in Roman numerous, Fashion 46. Erica joined Main Street with her clothing store in the former Linda's Hair Salon. Since she is a real seal, red seal hairdresser with over a 10 years experience, she has decided to go back to what she loves. Her salon will be open March 1st and available for walk-ins. She will be offering evening and weekend appointments in her newly renovated space at 41 Main Street. She will still be offering beautiful floor arrangements, fresh cuts and even fresher flowers down at Fashion 46. Former North Cyprus Langford CAO charged with theft by the Banner staff. Manitoba RCMP have made a big step forward in a major criminal investigation in Carbrian area. Two incidents of theft are currently considered connected. They are the theft of approximately $30,000 from the Carberry Curling Club and the theft of a sum of money from the rural municipality of North Cyprus Langford during the 2023-2024 year. The alleged suspect in this case is identified as 36-year-old Trish Fraser. Fraser is being charged with theft over 5,000. She was released from RCMP custody and is scheduled to appear in court on April 4th, 2024 in Brandon. Timeline of incident. Carberry M RCMP received the report of significant theft from the Carberry Curling Club on December 7th, 2023. This report stated that the former treasurer had allegedly stolen money throughout the year. Th through the investigation that followed, it was determined that the suspect, while acting as the volunteer treasurer for the club, may have stole the sum of about $30,000. The suspect then left the position of treasurer, and while holding down the position of chief administrative officer of the RM of North Cyprus Langford, had allegedly utilized unauthorized funding from the RM to pay back the curling club. Per previous report in the Dem December 22, 2023 edition of the Nipua Banner and Press, Fraser was announced as dismissed from her position of CO CAO with the RM on December 15. Prior to this public announcement, the RM of North Cyprus Langford also released statements on December 11th and 12th, noting that they were aware of a concerning municipal si situation an investigation into an employee that was placed on paid leave was being conducted and the RM office would be closed to the public from December 13th to December 15th, but would reopen on December 18th. The statements at that time did not provide further comment as the investigation was ongoing. A new CAO appointed. During these events, Teresa Parker was important, appointed interim CAO for the municipality. Since then, Parker was reportedly to be officially listed to the position of CAO within the past month. 
The alleged events concerning Fraser are still pending as they have yet to be proven in court. And Gladstone Theatre raises money for local causes. Uh, above, the Gladstone Theatre Group is set to perform Whatever Happened to Little Creek Ranch on March 16th to raise funds for palliative care by Kelvin Buchert. I thought a life in the country would be easy, said Becky, a young woman who had left the city in search of a better life. Nothing in the country is easy, ma'am, was the only wisdom that the ranch hands she asked for help had to offer. Even the horses in the corral beside her cabin didn't like her. Why am I here anyway, was the question that Becky found herself answering, asking. Good question, why are you here? That was what the ranch hands were thinking. As one crazy situation followed another, they all learned a lesson about themselves and what it means to finally find your way home. A story full of horses, horsing around, and even a little horse sense. Join us as we discover whatever happened to Little Creek Ranch. With special musical guest, Greg Fair. Craig Fair. Well, what can I say? I wrote an original comedy with Julian Evans, and then we found a talented cast from different places. Next thing you know, we have a show to put on, said co-writer-director Kevin Buchert. But best of all, we're glad that we can help out some worthy causes in the places where we're performing. At the McGregor Show on March 16th, we're helping our Kid Ranch. At Kid Ranch, children are partnered one-on-one -on -one with Christian mentors who show them love and compassion they so desperately need. Children have an opportunity to learn all kinds of skills and enjoy many activities alongside a mentor who walks through life with them, said Kids Ranch board member Carissa Isaac. In Gladstone on March 22nd, we're performing in support of the local palliative care program, so I'm sure I can speak for everybody involved when I say I hope to see you all at the show, added Kelvin. There is free admission, but we do ask that people reserve tickets so that we have an idea of how many desserts to have on hand on show night. Tickets can be reserved at the www.themobilestageco.ca or by calling 204-385-3232. And better than we could ever have hoped for, new Gladstone-based restaurant receives an overwhelming welcome by Casper Warren. Spring is a season of new beginnings, and although we're not quite there yet, Gladstone is getting an early start. The community and surrounding area welcomed brand new business venture with open arms this month with the official opening of the Gladstone Roadhouse. Gladstone Roadhouse is owned and operated by Chris Frere. Frere also acknowledged Gerald Bisson, who has been a great asset in aiding Frere to spearhead and run the restaurant. Bisson once owned the Gladstone Hotel and is well known in the area for his pizza making abilities. It's a good small town home cooking restaurant, said owner Chris Frere. You get some traditional meals, you know, hot turkey sandwiches, turkey dinners, roast beef dinners, pizzas. We specialize in our burgers. Perhaps it's this home cooked quality that has area patrons flocking to it. According to Frere, ever since the restaurant first opened at 21 Logie Street on February 7th, he and his team have been working non-stop ever since. The community sport has been absolutely overwhelming. It's to the point sometimes where we're so busy it just takes a little longer for everyone to get their food. But everyone seems okay with it. It's very busy sometimes, but it's fantastic for our enthused. It's better than we could ever have hoped for. This nature of support isn't exclusive to the restaurant now being opened. Frere shared that he was actually from Ontario, but has been working at Gladstone for approximately 19 years for a company known as Charlie B. Honey, which produces honey in the rural community. So I live part-time here. I'll go home for a couple of weeks, and I'll be back for a couple of weeks, Frere chuckled. And soon bee season will open, so I have to work bees, so I'll be out here for that as well. Long-term plan, I'll probably eventually move here. But for the time being, I have two irons in the fire, so to speak. Frere added, I made a lot of good close friends in the community here over the years, and one thing the town hasn't had for several years is a good regular restaurant. So, when this opportunity arose, I saw something I could do for the community, something the community needed, and it was too good to pass up. In the process of preparing the building at 21 Logie for its debut as a restaurant, Frere said the community lent a helping hand. 
various people in the community just really pitched in a lot of time and elbow grease to get it up to par. It's just been fantastic, Prayer shared. Frere extends his heartfelt thanks to everyone from Gladstone and the surrounding areas for their support. Gladstone Roadhouse is currently open Tuesday through Sunday starting at 7 a.m. <coughs> BP School Vision unveils proposed budget for 2024-2025 by Owen Devereaux. The Beautiful Plain School Division, BPSD, has done the math on its potential budget for the next school year. An online video review of the proposal, as well as a printable copy of the document, were uploaded, uploaded to the School Division website on Thursday, February 29th. BPSD Superintendent Jason Young and Secretary Treasurer Shannon Bays explained the details behind the numbers in the video. For the upcoming year, the total proposed budget is expected to be $28,814,400. That amount is an increase of just over $2.25 million from the previous year and is an 8.5% increase year over year. Increasing staff car costs are the primary factor in that increase. More teachers and other support staff have been needed as the student enrollment within school division has continued to rise over the last several years. Nipua has been the most affected with an additional 236 students enrolled since 2021. 1,228 in 2021 versus 1,464 currently. And where's the money come from? Beautiful Plains is funded 62.9% through provincial funding and 34.2% through the local funding. The other 2.9% is raised through tax grants and other revenues. And what's this mean for you? As for what the proposed budget will mean for our property taxes, the cost to a homeowner will go up $23 on average for every $100,000 of value of their home. For commercial properties per 100,000 value, it will go up to $33, while for farms, it will go up by $13 per 100,000. The mill rate, which is the amount of tax payable per $1,000 of the assessed value of the property, will go from 10.1 to 10.62. And an editor's note, in previous years, the Manitoba government has mailed out an education property tax rebate to eligible property owners. Back in December, the Winnipeg Free Press reported that the NDP announced that it will not mail out checks for the $453 million education property tax rebate brought in by the Progressive Conservative. Pre Premier Wab Canoe did add, however, that the 50% tax cut would instead be applied directly to municipal property tax bills in 2024. And what's next? Beautiful Plains School Division trustees will review these details and likely finalize the budget on their next meeting on March 5th. The public can comment on the budget by contacting bpsd at bpsd.mb.ca or any of their trustees. The budget must be submitted to the province by March 31st. Beautiful Plains is a rural division that stretches from Spruce Woods Provincial Park to Riding Mountain National Park. It has 14 schools within the district, seven community schools and seven Hutteritarian schools, and its major centres are Carberry, Nipua, Brookdale and Eden. It has approximately 300 staff members and 2,260 plus students. McCreary box sledding, and pictured on the right side, Monday, May 19th was the scene of McCreary's second annual cardboard toboggan challenge. The event had approximately 100 people in attendance and seven competitors. Competitors brought their decorated cardboard box toboggans and took turns riding them down the toboggan hill. Some of these toboggans are pictured above. The most popular toboggan will receive a $50 cash prize. Votes for the most popular toboggan were closed this week on February 29th after the paper went to print. And pictured here, Highland Dance, some of the dance students who participated in the February 16th medal tests, and this was submitted. Medal tests were held on Friday, February 16th at Expressive Dance with Crystal Studio in Minidosa. The examiner was Galen McGregor, who traveled out from Winnipeg. She is an examiner with the Scottish Dance Teachers Alliance. 24 of Crystal Scott's Highland dancers completed a total of 78 exams. 
Some exams include four dances as well as demonstrating technique. Many dancers completed two to four exams each. There were Highland Dance exams, Scottish Nationals, Irish Dig, Jig, Choreographics and Theory exams. The marking system is as follows. Dance stars up to preliminary receive a pass. Pre-bronze up to award six receive pass, pass plus, commended, commended plus, and highly commended. All theory precipitants receive top honors. Everyone was successful with their exams and they will see certificates and medals from Scotland at a later date. Crystal is so proud of her dancers as they continue to set goals and strive to keep reaching new achievements. <coughs> and big spread support of agriculture, which is so much a big important part of our community. So you can see there's supporting sponsors, please think about it. And into sports. Buster McPherson is making a big racket. Nipwa athlete competes at Keystone Classic in Winnipeg by over Owen Devereaux. Buster McPherson has started to compete on a provincial level in racquetball, including participating in the 48th annual Keystone Racquetball Classic in Winnipeg. Racquetball is not a sport that's huge in Nipwa right now, but Buster McPherson is doing his part to perhaps change all that. The 13-year-old, who started playing the game just a few months ago, recently competed in the Keystone Classic in Winnipeg. The Keystone of one of Canada's longest-running racquetball tournaments, having started back in 1976. In total, 40 athletes of all ages and skill levels from across the prairies hit the court. For McPherson, this event, while well, not his first tournament, was his first against some of the sport's top-tier players. Buster was able to meet that challenge and exceed expectations, finishing third overall in his skill category, which is junior singles, badge level three and four. McPherson ended the round robin competition with a 2-2 match record, an important first, uh, impressive first outing for someone who's still developing their game. But for now, trophies don't matter that much to Buster as his interest in a new sport that challenges him. I want to stay active and this year I wanted to try a new winter sport. I love to ski, so I wanted time to be able to do that. This year, while also doing a new sport, I found out that Bra Brandon has racquetball, and I wanted to try that since I already like badminton, tennis, and ping pong, said McPherson. As for the Keystone, I wasn't sure how I would do. I've been practicing a lot, but I knew that there would be kids from all across the province because it's based on my level and not age. I played against kids that were 16 and 17 years old, and I was one of the youngest in the group. It was a big challenge, but I was happy with how I played overall. Some of these kids have been playing for a few years, so being my first year, I was really happy with how I played. As for how he goes about practicing his game, McPherson travels to Brandon every Wednesday and Saturday to train with Curtis Cullen, who operates the Brandon Racquetball Association Junior Program. Cullen is himself a top-ranked competitor who finished third overall at the National Racquetball Championship last year. As his skill level has progressed with Cullen over the winter, McPherson has set new goals, including playing in another tournament in March and then competing at the Junior Provincials, which are scheduled for April. <coughs> and the Nipua Titans start, game, start winning game again at just the right time by Owen Deverode. And pitcher is Col Connor Thompson advances the puck into the Swan Valley zone during the Titans' 7-3 win over the Stampeders on Saturday, February 24th. In his last three games, Thompson has six points, four goals and two assists. When it mattered most this season, the Nipua Titans put together their at most complete team effort out there on the ice. That commitment to excellence has paid off in a big way with three straight with winning three straight games, including an important 7-0 win over the Wayway Capital Wolverines on Tuesday, February 27th. The victory over Wayway gave Nipua a three-point lead in the MJHL standings over the Wolverines for the fourth and final playoff spot in the Western Division. With eight games remaining in the schedule, the Titans have a 24-25-1 record, good enough for 49 points. These numbers also give Nipua something perhaps even more important, control of their own playoff destiny. 
After their 7-0 win over the Weiwei Sikapo on Tuesday, Nipua Titans head coach and general manager Ken Pearson said that it was one of the best performances the entire roster has put together this season. That's probably the best 60 minutes, complete 60, that we've played all season from start to finish. Every line, every player just contributed out there in a positive way that in that win, said Pearson. Coming into tonight's game, we went over a few things with the guys related to the last time we played the Wolverines. Cleaned up a few things we didn't like and just told them to be relentless out there tonight, and I think we did that. We committed to the back check, our puck retrieval was solid, and we focused on the penalty kill and ensuring they didn't get any easy chances. Our guys really created a lot of offense out there as well. Aside from the goals, there were a lot of quality scoring chances we were able to put together by using their speed and going to the net. They stepped up in a big way and were rewarded for it. As of Thursday, February 29th, there are eight games remaining on the Nipah Titans regular season schedule. The next home game is Friday, March 1st, versus the Swan Valley Stampeders. Start time is set for 7.30. And pictured here is the Titans celebrate their 7-0 shout-out win over the Weiwei Kappa Wolverines on February 27th. Along with wins over the weekend in Selkirk and at home versus Swan Valley, the Titans has now surpassed Weiwei in the standings and are back in fourth place and holding on to that final postseason spot in the West Division. <clears throat> and the Tigers win home ice advantage. Nipua finished first in WHSHL regular season standings by Owen Devereaux. A pair of road wins over the weekend gave the Nipua Area Collegiate Institute, NACI Tigers, the top seed in their Westman High School Hockey League playoffs. Nipua earned a 7-2 win over the Bertel Falcons on Friday, Friday February 23rd. They followed that up on Sunday, February 25th, with a dominant 11-3 victory in Verdun over the Golden Bears. With these pair of results, the Tigers closed out the regular season with a 25-4-1 record, good enough for 51 points in the standings, and one point better than the Vincent Massey Vikings at 25-5-0, 50 points. That also gives Nipua a home ice advantage throughout the playoffs. From a historic context, this is the third time the Tigers have won the regular season, with 2013 being the last season in which NACI went into the postseason as the top team. As if all this league success weren't enough for Nipua, finishing first overall has also secured the Tigers a spot in the upcoming AAAA Provincial Hockey Championship in Winnipeg. Consistency was the key. Nipua Tigers Co-coach Mike Adams spoke with the Banner and Press regarding the team's impressive regular season. He said the roster had been focused all year on achieving this specific goal. At the start of the season, we set a goal of finishing as high as possible in the standings. A lot of things have to break right to finish first overall. Being consistent for 30 games and showing up every day with your best effort is something we focus on. And of course, you need a little help from other teams once in a while. We've been talking about finishing first overall since January because a lot comes with it, like the spot in the AAAA for Provincials and home ice throughout the playoffs, said Adams. Not overlooking the Wildcats. As for the WHSHL playoffs, Nipua has been paired with the GCB Wildcats in the opening round. The team played a pair of games at the start of the regular season, with Nipua winning both times. Adams noted, however, that it will be a tougher version of the team they'll meet up with in the postseason. GCB is coming off a gold medal at the AAA Provincials this past weekend. They have balanced attack and they take very few penalties. Our two teams were the least penalized in the league this season, so when they do happen, it will be important for us to take advantage of any power play chances we get. Playoff schedule. Details of the first round schedule have been released. The Tigers will host GCB on Wednesday, February 28th at the Yellowhead Centre. That game concluded after the Banner and Press publication deadline. Game 2 is to be held in Carberry on Friday, March 1st and a 7 p.m. start time. Game 3, if necessary, will be played in Nipua on Sunday, March 3rd. Start time is set for 3.30 p.m. at the Yellowhead Centre. <coughs> A great year for the Nipua Golf and Country Club. Club host its 80th annual general meeting on Tuesday, February 20th by Owen Devereaux. 
There are plenty of positives to report coming out of the Nipah Golf and Country Club's NGCC annual general meeting. An in-person gathering was held at the Royal Canadian Legion No. 23 on Tuesday, February 20th, with club members assembled to hear how the NGCC is faring going into the 2024 golf season. Board President Warren McLeod noted that last year included several bright spots, including completion of a new, larger deck, expansion of wheelchair accessibility at the clubhouse, and expanded shed storage. The most important additions, however, would be the new irrigation system for the old number no. 9 and the new bridge to permanently replace the one damaged by the 2020 flood. McLeod added that there were a lot of improvements the staff, volunteers and members of the golf club should be very proud of. Positives in the financials. After McLeod's, McLeod's opening statement, he passed the meeting to Craig Johnson, who reviewed the financial statements for the fiscal year end. He stated that the numbers which were tabulated through Kinley Thompson were looking positive. The total revenue for 2023 was 626,768, an increase of 120,619 from the previous year. The largest increase in student revenue came from green fees, plus 41,847 year over year, clubhouse operations, plus 41,156, and cart rentals, plus 24,954. Food and beverage revenues also saw increases. Expenses, meanwhile, also rose year over year, going from 505,393 to 573,251. Those combined results meant that NGCC saw a net income for the year of $24,756. Johnson stated that's a solid turnaround from the 2022 results, which saw the club deal with a $56,416 net loss. Superintendent's report. Mark Kirkowich said 2023 was a pretty good season overall as they didn't have to deal with many weather extremes such as multiple rainy days or excessive heat. He thanked the volunteers for their help with flowers and garbage clearing. He also acknowledged the grounds crew for their amazing efforts to keep the course in the tremendous condition that it's known for. Maintenance was able to remain close to budget with the new irrigation system previously mentioned still on target. All the pipes and wiring needed in the old number no. 9 are in the ground and the wet well has been installed. All that remains to be done is the new pump house. One other item Kirkowich mentioned was a proposed tree planting program for the golf course. He hopes to proceed with the installation of some new trees sometime in the fall, time and budget permitting. General Manager's Report General Manager and CPGA Head Golf Professional Landon Cameron was next to speak. He purported that a combined 22,000 rounds of golf were played on the course in 2023, which was a bit busier than the years in the past. He said the shape of the course and good word of mouth on that helped bring in a few more rounds from outside of the community. As well, the clubhouse restaurant saw a profitable season, which Camion attributed to doing a better job with social media promotion directly to their membership. The restaurant is currently looking for staff to assist with operation of the kitchen. A number of tournaments are already booked for 2024, including the Manitoba Men's Mid-Amateur and Women's, Women's Amateur Championships. This is the first time these major events have been in Nipua and will take place from July 4th to 6th. NCG, NGCC has also been selected as a host for the 2025 Prairie Lynx Canadian Junior Tournament. It's been about 10 years since Nipawa last hosted, hosted that event. For the regular membership, one other positive to report is the purchase of 35 new EZ Go golf, golf carts. The exact cost of the purchase was not discussed, but they're likely well subsidized by the sale of the old carts, in which NGCC received 5,500 on trade per cart. <clears throat> Minidosa Gladstone series, a close one so far. Tiger Hills Hockey League playoff results by Owen Devereaux. Whomever comes out the winner of the Minidosa Bombers Gladstone Lakers playoff series will definitely be able to say they've earned it. <clears throat> After two games in this best of five series in the Tiger Hills Hockey League, THHL, Eastern Semi-Final, each club has won a game. The Lakers started off with a massive 6-5 victory in overtime on Friday, February 23rd. 
It is a hu huge come-from-behind effort in the third period that pushed Gladstone into extra time and ultimately the win. Trailing 5-2 with 20 minutes left in regulation, the Lakers scored three unanswered before Jory Geddes put away the winner, just 126 into overtime. During the regulation, Riley Bruce scored twice, including the game-tying goal with only 127 left in the third. J.C. Kennedy, Jesse Toff, and Dale Ev Evenson scored the others for Gladstone. As for the Bombers, they jumped out to an early 3-1 lead with Ch Shane Jury, Matt Saylor, and Mark Willis all scoring late in the first. They'll do the same again in the second with Jury and Bryson Wurbicki Mallet scoring in the final 315 of the second, making it a 5 2 for Minidosa. Minidosa rebounds in game two. The next night in Minidosa, the Bombers replied with a more dominant effort, eventually winning game two by a 6 2 score. After a scoreless first period for both clubs, Minidosa struck with four goals in the second. Bryson Wurbicki Mallet, Shane Jury, Tyler Jury, and Patrick Kudre. Kud Condra two all contributed goals with Tyler's coming off a power play. For the third Minidosa added one more early off of Ryan Hino opportunity. Connor Grunston picked up for Gladstone, but that was quickly negated with a second straight goal from Hino. Je Jesse Toth replied for Gladstone with one more goal with 354 left in the period, but that was all the Lakers could muster as the Bombers picked up the win, tying the series 1-1. Game three of the series was played on Wednesday, February 28th, just after the Banner and Press publication deadline. Details can be found online at the league's website, www.thhl.ca. Game four is scheduled for Friday, March 1st in Gladstone, while game five is necessary will be in Minidosa on Saturday, March 2nd. <coughs> and the Carby plays... Plainsmen play in Killarney Hockey Tournament by Jolene Belcunis. Our Cub Carberry under-11 Plainsmen traveled to Killarney last weekend for their league tournament. The first game was an unfortunate loss against Car Killarney, 13-1. Brody Serminski scored the only goal and received player of the game. After lunch, the teams took part in a fun skills competition. The second game against Oak Lake ended with a close 7-5 loss. Player of the game was awarded to Asher Fryer. The U11 team finished off their <coughs> season with the second day of their league tournament in Killarney. They won their first game against Verdon 4-3. Brody McDonald scored his first goal and is awarded player of the game. They lost their second game with a final score of 6-4. Brooke and Holiday was awarded player of the game. The fastest skater in the skills competition went to Brooklyn as well. Don't forget to pick up your Carson Yarnson bobblehead at the Sunday, March 2nd home game of the Brandon Wheat Kings. <coughs> Manitoba High School Hockey Provincial AA Tournament by Jolene Belcunis. And pictured above is the Manitoba High School Hockey Provincial AA Tournament champions. Manitoba High School Hockey Provincial AA Tournament was held February 22nd, 24th, 2024 in Boys of Aine. The Glenborough Carberry Balder GBC Wildcats participated in the tournament again this year and played their final game on Thursday the 22nd against the hosting Boys of Ainsuris Deloraine Wasquedo Broncos team. The GCB Wildcats picked up a 4-1 win with goals from Nathan Dick, assist Carter Elliott, Landon Bowman, assist from Carter Elliott in the first period. In the second period, Preston Shearer scored with an assist from Austin Dubitz and Jack Schuldice. Austin Dubitz potted the next one with an assist from Dylan Hood. The Broncos scored their lone goal to close out the second. There was no scoring in the third. Sawyer Weed picked up the win in the net for the GCB Wildcats' first game of the weekend. The GCB Wildcats' second game of the day was against the Killarney Wanwanisa Raiders. The first period was scoreless. The Raiders opened up the scoring in the second period at 13:37. The GCB Wildcats answered back with a goal from Nathan Dick and an assist from Carter Elliott at 158. The third period was a back and forth battle with both sides having good opportunities to score, but it was the Raiders scoring at 305 left in the game to hand the GCB Wildcats the loss. 
The GCP Wildcats ended, ended the round robin play in the second place in their pool with 1-1 record, moving them into the semi-finals on Friday against first place in Pool 2, the major Pratt Trojans from Russell. The GCB Wildcats wasted no time opening the scoring at 18:23 with a goal from Preston Shearer and assist from Jack Schuldice. This was followed up by a goal from Tucker Forbes and assist from Griffin Anderson. Major Pratt scored a goal to close out the first period. The second and third period scoring was all GCB Wildcats with goals from Jack Schuldice, assist Preston Shearer and Tucker Forbes, goal from Chase Nash assist Carter Elliott, goal from Preston Shearer, assist from Jack Schuldice and Dylan Hood, goal from Carter Elliott, assisted by Landon Bowman, third period goals from Preston Shearer, assist from Jack Schuldice, goal by Dylan Barnstable, assist from Jack Ramsey and Jason M Mueller, goal by Corbin Noel, assist by Jackson Mueller and Griffin Anderson. Sawyer Weeb recorded the win in net for GCB Wildcats. With that win, the GCB Wildcats would again face the Killarney Wawanisa Raiders in the gold medal game on Saturday the 24th. The GCB Wildcats showed up determined to erase the loss against the Raiders in the round robin play. GCB Wildcats opened up the scoring at 14-17 with a goal from Tucker Forbes and assist from Jack Schuldice. The Raiders responded with a goal with 2.54 left in the first, but not to be outdone, the GCB Wildcats answered back just over a minute later with a goal from Austin Dubitz and an assist from Tucker Forbes. The GCP Wildcats added to the total scoring three more goals in the second period from Austin Dubitz, assist Max Jantz, Griffin Anderson, assist from Landon Bowman and Carter Elliott, and a hat-trick goal from Austin Dubitz with assist from Tucker Forbes and Preston Shearer. Despite lots of action in the third period, there was no scoring. Sawyer Weeb chalked up another win between the pipes. Gold for the GCB Wildcats. Tournament All-Star Awards were given to number 9, Preston Shearer, number 21, Austin Dubitz, number 30, Sawyer Weeb. Dairy's Farmers of Manitoba Players' Choice Awards, number 21, Griffin Anderson, and tournament MVP to number 14, Tucker Forbes. We would like to extend a special thanks to Xander's Legacy, which sponsored the tournament to help raise mental health awareness. We all know the GCB Wildcats coaches and parents held Xander close in their hearts this weekend. If you would like to support Xander's Legacy in any way, please contact them at xanderslegacyfund at gmail.com. <coughs> and the Nipua Elks Cash Calendar winners. The Nipua Elks have announced a pair of winners from the area for their annual cash calendar fundraiser. The winners were Irene and Dennis Magwood of Franklin and Lauren and Val Cramman of Austin. Pictured left from left to right are Jim Small, Chairman, Nipua Elks, Irene and Dennis Magwood receiving a check from member Ron Petch, seller of the cash calendar. Winner's amount was $5,367.50. Pictured bottom left from left to right are Doreen Robertson, Nikoa Elks, Elks Calendar Cylinder to Lauren and Val Crammond of Austin, mailing address, and Jim Small, Chairman of Nipua Elks. This was the January 1st draw of $1,000. <coughs> and the 2024 Clan Gathering Report. Pictured are scenes from the 2024 Clan Gathering for students, friends, and family held by Expressive Dance with Crystal. And it was submitted. Expressive Dance with Crystal's Highland dancers and families celebrated their ninth clan gathering on Saturday, February 24th. The event was held at the Minidosa Ukrainian call Hall and was attended by 22 Highland dancers and around 80 family members. The afternoon started off with a showcase of traditional Highland dances, nationals dances from the lowlands of Scotland, jigs, hornpipes and choreographies. There was a break midway through the dancing to visit and enjoy snacks. The dancers who, who participated in the November 23 dance exam were then presented with their Highland Medals Test Awards. The, the event continued with a fabulous potluck supper, followed by family games, egg and spoon race, three-leg race, wheelbarrow race, tug of war, balance the haggis. The evening continued with an opportunity to get the families to try a few old-time pattern dances, like Road to the Isle, Heel Toe Polka, Seven Step, Four Horsemen, Shotsies, Waltz, French Minuet, and a few other tunes. A great addition to the evening was the local musicians, Carrie Clark, bass guitar, Clark McNabb, lead guitar, and Fred Scott, fiddle, who played the tunes for the dancers and their families to dance to. 
Thanks to all those who helped out in any way to make this memorable, fun-filled family event. <coughs> and finally, the Arden Open Curling Bond Spiel event winners. The event winners for the Arden Open Curling Bond Spiel have been announced. The 2024 event was held from February 23rd to 25th at the Arden Curling Club. The winners are, for New Era Seeds first event, picture top left, Neil Turner, Kayla Hunter, Michelle Pottinger, and Kreis Reg Kortkowski, who won against Ron Kabaki in the final event. For the Parrish and Heimbecker second event above, Al Paramore, Joan Paramore, Jason Dirksen, and Brittany O, oh, who won against Emmett Stanstrom for the final event. And the, for the Myers Penny third event, Ron Milnick, Craig Henderson, Danielle Henderson, and Cecil, Cecile Milnick, who won against Frank Parada in the final event. The Arden Curling Club extends its thanks to all those who made the event a success. And that concludes the paper for March 1st, 2024. I hope you enjoyed.